Meanwhile on Planet Jung, the Macarini gang successfully steals the blue orum they previously attempted due to the Galactic Patrol being out of the picture. Pasta, who'd possessed fake loyalty to Moro, tells his brother Getty to call Saganbo with a false story about scouting for another planet for Moro's energy absorption. As they depart Planet Jung, the gang contemplate their next target and recalls their encounter with the Galactic Patrol and Jocko mentioning the existence of Sky Gold on Earth. Pasta then hatches a plan and instructs his sister to head to toward Earth to steal as much as they can. At the same time, Vegeta finally arrives on planet Yardrat. Vegeta and Iriko touch down on Yardrat, much to the astonishment of the locals. Smaller, rounder Yardrats approach them, mistaking Iriko for Vegeta, whom Goku had previously informed them about. They express their gratitude to both Goku and Vegeta for defeating the Ginyu Force, who had caused trouble on their planet long ago. Vegeta inquires about the Yardrat who taught Goku instant transmission, and one of the Yardrats make the others disappear revealing that he was alone all along. This Yardrat explains that they occasionally create copies of themselves to deter unwanted visitors and then leads Vegeta to meet their elder. The elder, named Pabara, mistakenly believes Iriko is Vegeta and proceeds to converse with him, although he's soon corrected. Vegeta clarifies the situation to Pibara, expressing his desire to defeat Moro and hoping to acquire a new technique. Pibara, however, informs Vegeta that Yardradians focus only on a single technique called Spirit Control, as they're a relatively weak race. They demonstrate some of these abilities, including instant transmission, multiform, and gigantification, which involves manipulating their own spirits to shift, split, and grow. The Elder states that should Vegeta study how the spirit functions, he'll be able to do the same, and Vegeta expresses a desire to learn spirit control. A few days later, Goku and Miris embark on training on another planet. Meanwhile, time passes at the Galactic Patrol HQ, and with Goku, Miris, and Vegeta Absent, the Galactic King suggests recruiting new special members for the Galactic Patrol. He inquires with Jocko about Piccolo, the warrior from the Universe 6 tournament they'd attended in the past. At the lookout, Piccolo attempts telepathic communication with someone on New Namek, unaware of the planet's destruction by Moro, but wary that something awful has happened. Meanwhile, the Macarini gang arrives on Earth in search of Blue Aurum. Piccolo senses their approach and informs Dende. However, Piccolo doesn't seem worried as he states their energy signatures are weak. Moments later in a rocky plane, Piccolo confronts the group as they're searching for a place to land. Noticing Piccolo, the gang use their ship's weapons to attack him, but he evades the gunfire and lands on top of their ship, admonishing them for their rudeness. Meanwhile, Boma, accompanied by Hercule and Bola, arrive at the lookout in search of Piccolo. Apparently, Jocko had called to inform her that he was on his way to Earth to recruit Piccolo into the Galactic Patrol. Back on the battlefield, Piccolo makes quick work of the Macarini gang, surprised them as they had no idea someone this strong lived on Earth. After Jocko explains the situation via communicator at the lookout, he tells Boma to gather Gohan, Krillin, and Tien in preparation for his arrival. He goes on to say that if Moro catches wind of Earth anytime soon, he'll make his way there to steal its energy. Meanwhile, Piccolo questions the now restrained Macarini gang, suspecting their connection to the cosmic disturbances. The gang attempts to deceive Piccolo by pretending to be innocent travelers. However, they secretly plan to inform Moro about the Earth and the opportunity to steal Blue Aura. Convinced that they're not involved after all, Piccolo releases the group and warns them to never return to Earth again. As they depart, Bulma and Dende approach Piccolo in a ship, with Dende urging Piccolo to capture the gang as they're allied with those causing trouble. Piccolo shoots down the Macarini gang's ship and captures them again, but he's informed that it's too late as the gang already alerted Moro's main forces. In space, Saganbo receives a distress signal signal from the Macarini gang, prompting Moro to dispatch a stronger scouting party to investigate. Meanwhile, Goku and Miris begin their training, with Miris wielding a staff and gaining the upper hand. Goku mentions that to acquire his desired ability, he needs to clear his mind and heart, but this proves challenging during their combat with his fluctuating emotions. Miris points out that emotions can also lead to power, such as Goku's Super Saiyan form fueled by rage. However, what Goku seeks requires the opposite, calmness. Miris reveals he knew about Goku's pursuit of Ultra Instinct, but kept it quiet. Goku, however, reassures him and tells him it's fine, and suggests they resume training, surprising him. Miris, now resolved, leads Goku to the Galactic Patrol's hyperbolic time chamber, where every day inside equals to three days outside. They enter to allow Miris to unleash his full power without detection, and Miris questions if Goku is ready to continue their training, as Goku eagerly agrees.
degrees. At the lookout, Boma briefs Krillin on the current situation and inquires about the whereabouts of Gohan and Tien. Krillin informs her that Gohan is attending a college lecture and will join them later, and Tien doesn't have a cell phone, making him unreachable. The idea of contacting Yamcha is brought up, but before anyone can respond, Jocko arrives, expressing frustration about the lack of formidable warriors present. Eska, also aboard the ship, greets Dende. Jocko then informs Piccolo that he, Dende, and Eska are the three last surviving Namekians. Suddenly, Pasta, confined in a cage, voices his doubts about the group's chances against Moro. Jocko approaches and threatens him, warning that they'll soon return to prison. However, Pasta shocks Jocko by revealing that Moro's main force is on its way to Earth to rescue them. Simultaneously, a single ship carrying Shimareka, Seven Three, and Yunba heads toward Earth. While discussing Earth's value, Seven Three states that it's in its development stage, based on outdated information from before they were incarcerated in the galactic prison. With Yunba hungry, they decide to make a brief pit stop on a nearby planet. Back on Earth, the Galactic Patrol informs Jocko about the impending arrival of the three henchmen, particularly Seven Three, whose name brings about fear in Jocko's expression. After sharing this vague information with the others, Jocko prepares to leave, but Boma attempts to stop him. Piccolo questions Jocko about what they need to know regarding the approaching henchmen, and Jocko agrees to provide some insight before departing. Jocko explains that while all three henchmen are formidable, Seven Three is the most concerning. Meanwhile, Shimareka and Yumba are on a planet, indulging in a feast while 7-3 confronts the planet's inhabitants. He uses his power absorbing ability to steal their abilities and swiftly incapacitates them. At the lookout, Jocko continues his explanation, stating that any ability 7-3 has stolen lasts for half an hour. He also reveals that 7-3 is an artificial being created by a technologically advanced planet, devoid of emotions and designed as a ruthless killing machine programmed to follow orders. Krillin inquires about the convict's ETA to Earth, and the response from Jocko is 10 days. However, 7-3 along with Yunba and Shimareka suddenly appear at the lookout, surprising everyone as they were able to steal the abilities of a creature on the planet who could create warp portals. Shimareka then notices the Macarini gang in their cage and informs them that Moro considers traitors expendable. He moves to execute them, much to their shock, but is halted by Piccolo, who tells them that killing is prohibited at the sanctuary, where evildoers aren't welcome. However, 7-3 swiftly appears behind Piccolo, seizing him by the neck and copies his abilities. Piccolo manages to break free from 7-3's grasp and narrowly dodges a special beam cannon fired by the artificial beam. 7-3 follows up with a punch that extends toward Jocko, knocking him off the lookout. Piccolo races after Jocko, believing him unable to fly, with 7-3 and Shimareka in pursuit. Krillin attempts to assist, but is halted by Yunba, who plans to take him on. In free fall, Jocko activates the jet boosters in his boots, allowing him to land safely to Piccolo's surprise. Piccolo questions Jocko about the best way to fight 7-3, and Jocko explains that 7-3's copied attacks are as powerful as if they were executed by the original fighter, essentially like battling a mirror image of oneself. 7-3 then appears and locks arms with Piccolo using his own extending technique, and the two then land to meet each other with a headbutt. At the same time, Jocko engages Shimareka in combat as he stole his sidearm by surprise. Despite sharing the same techniques and power, Piccolo seems to be at a disadvantage due to 7-3's limitless stamina, pointed out by Jocko who previously forgot to mention it. At the lookout, Krillin faces difficulties against Yunba, and Hercule tries to assist him thanks to Bulma's intervention. However, before Hercule can react, Yunba leaps around the sanctuary and transforms into a ball and strikes Krillin, sending both of them crashing through the sanctuary. Bulma and the others board the ship to follow the combatants, and meanwhile, Piccolo and 7-3 engage in a special beam cannon clash, but Piccolo struggles due to his diminished energy. The Namekian is seemingly overwhelmed, and Jocko fears that he may have been obliterated. However, Piccolo was saved by Gohan, who suddenly arrived. Piccolo warns Gohan about 7-3's ability, and informs him that, in Goku and Vegeta's absence, he's Earth's strongest fighter. Meanwhile, on an uninhabited planet, Goku and Mirus continue their training, though Goku encounters difficulties. Mirus inquires if Ultra Instinct was initially triggered during an extreme crisis, and suggests replicating those conditions. He states that Goku must be prepared to die during their training, and a battered Goku stands, telling Mirus to attack him with the intent to kill. Simultaneously, Vegeta is shown training on planet Yardrat, attempting to meditate on a narrow spike, but running out of patience. He questions Pibara on how much longer his training will take, and Pibara explains that Vegeta must achieve balance 
rats in body and mind as his spirit is less stable than Goku's. One of the yard rats tells Vegeta that Goku was able to meditate this long for 150 days and Vegeta starts to regret his decision to come to yard rat. Gohan lands a powerful punch to 7-3's midsection, sending him plummeting to the ground. However, 7-3 bounces back and retaliates quickly by using Piccolo's Hell Zone grenade technique. Gohan manages to escape the explosion and swiftly reappears behind his opponent, delivering a powerful blow that incapacitates 7-3. Piccolo joins Gohan, offering praise but also expressing mixed feelings about seeing Gohan defeat a copy of him so easily as he gives him new clothes and urges him to finish the job. 7-3, not yet defeated, resorts to using the Great Namekian technique to grow to an enormous size. However, this transformation grants Gohan an advantage in terms of maneuverability, allowing him to evade all of 7-3's attacks and eventually sending him crashing to the ground. Shimareka and Yunba rush to 7-3's aid, with Shimareka urging his fallen comrade to copy Gohan's abilities at any cost. 7-3 rises to his feet and begins utilizing Piccolo's demon hand technique to extend his arms. Gohan evades the attacks while charging up an ultimate Kamehameha, flying in and out of the rocky terrain before or preparing to unleash it directly at 7-3's face. However, just as Gohan is about to release the Kamehameha, 7-3's 30 minute time limit for Piccolo's abilities expires. Jocko urges Gohan to fire the blast anyway to finish him off while he has the chance, and as Gohan launches the blast, Shimareka commands 7-3 to utilize any stored abilities he has in stock. 7-3 then switches to Moro's abilities before the Kamehameha detonates. A huge flash of light ensues, and as the effect Effects dissipate, 7-3 is left unharmed, surprising Piccolo, who confirms that he was able to eat the Kamehameha. Jocko informs the surprised Piccolo that 7-3 can actually switch between copied abilities and can store up to three identities at a time. 7-3 then raises his hand, and Jocko urgently instructs his companions to take him down immediately to prevent energy absorption, similar to the technique Moro used on New Namek. Piccolo, Krillin, and Jocko charge at 7-3, but their advance is halted by an energy barrier rising from the earth, enveloping him. Gohan attempts to attack as well, but his efforts are halted too. Shimareka then contacts Saganbo to report the situation, and Moro is intrigued to learn that his abilities were already put to use, disliking the idea of it becoming a regular occurrence. Saganbo instructs Shimareka to switch to monitor mode, allowing those on the ship to observe the events on earth. Back on earth, Gohan, Piccolo, Krillin, and Jocko start feeling the effects of their energy being drained, although the energy isn't drawn from the earth itself as it's been reserved solely for Moro. As Moro observes, Saganbo states he's surprised to see that the planet harbors fighters more formidable than his own men. Shimareka and Yunba overwhelm the exhausted heroes, but Piccolo reminds Shimareka not to get overconfident, emphasizing that even if they fall, Goku and Vegeta will eventually return to avenge them. When Krillin reveals that Goku and Vegeta are training to defeat Moro, the information is transmitted to those aboard the ship. Saganbo suggests they should proceed to destroy Earth and orders his men to withdraw. However, Moro realizes that once Goku and Vegeta's training is complete, they'll possess even more energy for him to consume. Moro then tells Saganbo to inform his men to retreat from Earth, only to return once Goku and Vegeta arrive. The trio then cease their assault on the Z Fighters and begin their departure, informing them that they'll return in Galactic Cycle 7, which translates to 20 Earth days. However, Jocko interjects, explaining that due to Earth Earth's primitive technology, they won't be able to arrive until Galactic Cycle 8. Shimareka acknowledges this and states he'll relay the message to Moro, much to Jocko's relief. The trio then depart using 7-3's copied abilities, and Jocko informs Gohan, Piccolo, and Krillin that they have approximately two months until their return. Meanwhile, Mirus receives information from the Galactic Patrol regarding Moro's impending arrival on Earth and relays the news to Goku. Given Goku and Mirus's location, they're granted a six-month window to train. Ready to resume their training, Goku notices that he's never seen Mirus eat before. Mirus explains that it makes no difference to him, which triggers Goku's recollection of Whis mentioning something similar in the past. The two continue their training, and at the same time, at Zeno's palace, Whis uses his staff to monitor Goku and Mirus. The Grand Priest joins him, and Whis apologizes for the disruption in his universe. He informs the Grand Priest that he's there to discuss the matters related to their angel laws, and the Grand Priest correctly 
deduces that his son refers to the situation with Miris. The Grand Priest informs Whis about his decision regarding Miris, the angel trainee he'd sent to Universe 7 to gain a broader perspective on the mortal world. Despite the rule that angels must remain impartial though, Miris joined the Galactic Patrol and developed a strong sense of right and wrong. The Grand Priest has decided it's time to recall Miris, but Whis requests permission to handle Miris in his own way. Whis reminds his father that Miris had only used mortal weapons in battle and was training Goku, similar to what Whis himself has done in the past. The Grand Priest ultimately accepts Whis's proposal, but urges him to keep a close eye on Miris as he doesn't wish to lose an angel. As the deadline approaches, Miris queries Goku for one final sparring session before returning to Earth. They decide not to hold back and begin powering up, but suddenly find themselves outside with Whis nearby. Goku is surprised to learn that Miris is Whis's younger brother and an angel, and Whis scolds Miris for his plan to use his full strength in battle and travel to Earth to confront Moro. Goku questions what would happen if an angel fought, and Whis explains that angels who violate their code are erased from existence without a trace. Whis informs Miris that his time in the mortal realm is over, and with a tap on his staff, reveals Miris's angelic clothing and halo. Miris apologizes to Goku for not being able to see the task to the end, but expresses confidence in his ability to defeat Moro. Miris and Whis then depart for the angel world, and left alone, Goku realizes he needs to return to Earth, but finds himself with a galactic patrol ship that he has no idea how to operate. Meanwhile, Jocko, accompanied by several other members of the Galactic Patrol, arrive on Earth in anticipation for Moro's impending attack. They join Gohan, Piccolo, Krillin, Tien, Yamcha, Shoutsu, and Master Roshi. Yamcha is eager for a chance to shine, Shoutsu is uneasy due to his long absence from combat, and Krillin inquires about the whereabouts of Goku and Vegeta. Jocko informs Krillin that he's alerted Goku, but has no information on Vegeta's location, confident that both will arrive eventually. At the lookout, Boo is returned to Earth by another Galactic Patrol member, and suddenly, Dende and Mr. Popo spot Saganbo's spaceship entering Earth's atmosphere. Multiple smaller ships emerge from the main vessel and disperse across Earth, opening fire on high-value structures. The pilots disembark from their aircrafts with intentions on claiming the treasures within these structures for themselves, and the Earthlings attempt to defend themselves. Recognizing the situation, Master Roshi proposes that the group split up, while Gohan and Piccolo deal with the main threat. Krillin and Master Roshi come across Yunba first. As they confront Yunba, Krillin launches an attack, but Yunba blocks it and recognizes him. Krillin asserts that he's trained for two months to prepare, and Yunba prepares to settle things as a trio of female convicts accompanying him, whom Master Roshi notices, decides to target other locations on Earth to incite chaos. Krillin attempts to warn Master Roshi about Yunba's deceptive speed, but Master Roshi is more interested in the women and pursues them instead. Leaving Krillin dumbfounded, Yunba takes the opportunity to land a powerful blow to his face, sending him crashing into a nearby structure. Meanwhile, Gohan and Piccolo face Shimareka, who's joined by 7-3. 7-3, camouflaged, suddenly appears behind them and grabs both Gohan and Piccolo by their necks, copying their abilities. Jocko reprimands Gohan and Piccolo for letting their guard down, and Shimareka taunts them, claiming their training was in vain. 7-3 fires a special beam cannon, but Gohan creates an energy shield to block it. Piccolo powers up and fires a special beam cannon of his own at 7-3, overpowering his enemy's blast and catching the attention of the Z fighters across the globe, as he severely damages 7-3's upper body and left arm. 7-3 regenerates using Piccolo's abilities, but Gohan and Piccolo don't seem worried, as they were ready for their abilities to be copied. Believing the two to be bluffing, Shimareka advises 7-3 to switch to Gohan's abilities since he's the strongest between the two. 7-3 then fires a volley of energy shots at them. Gohan uses Piccolo's energy shots as footholds to approach quickly and delivers a punch that sends 7-3 into the sea. Jocko commends their teamwork, acknowledging that 7-3 can't evade their combined attacks. Elsewhere, Yamcha engages three of Moro's henchmen in battle within a city and gains the upper hand. One of the henchmen is surprised because Yamcha appeared weak, but Yamcha corrects him, asserting himself as one of the three strongest Earthlings. After a brief skirmish, Yamcha prevails and instructs the Galactic Patrol members to apprehend the defeated henchmen. He then senses more convicts and heads off as the Galactic Patrol follows. Back on the main battlefield, Gohan and Pit 
Piccolo execute the Masenko Beam Cannon, a combination of the Masenko and Special Beam Cannon techniques, further damaging 7-3. However, it's not enough to defeat him. Shimareka instructs 7-3 to switch to Moro's abilities to drain their energy, but to their surprise, Androids 17 and 18 suddenly arrive to kick them in the face. 17 questions their enemy's strength and ponders if Piccolo really needs them, but Piccolo explains that 17 and 18 are the only ones who can finish the battle, as they don't have key that can be absorbed. Aboard his spaceship, Moro berates his men for failing to meet even his lowest expectations of them. When Saganbo inquires about their next move, Moro assures him not to worry and announces his intention to personally handle the situation. Meanwhile on planet Yardrat, Vegeta continues his training under Pibara's guidance. Pibara senses the disturbance in Earth's spirit, but Vegeta is intent to focus on mastering his new technique. Vegeta mentions that he still has time, as Moro hasn't entered the battle himself yet, and in another part of Universe 7, Goku stops on a planet to ask the locals for directions to Earth. Elsewhere in deep space, Frieza also sits in orbit with his crew, originally poised to set a course for Earth, but deciding to move on, as tangling with galactic prisoners right now would be troublesome for him. Back at the lookout, Boma finishes configuring monitors linked to drones, providing Chi-Chi and the others with a view of the ongoing battles on the ground. Krillin remains engaged in his fight with Yunba, launching a destructo disc hexablade, but Yunba deflects them with his extreme speed body rotation. Landing several strong blows, Yunba sends Krillin crashing to the ground. However, Krillin quickly recovers and resumes the attack, sending one of the discs hurtling back and narrowly cutting Yunba. In a clever move, Krillin uses his after image technique to deceive Yunba with incoming destructo discs. He appears behind Yunba and unleashes a powerful Kamehameha that sends him crashing to the ground below, knocking him out and securing victory. The Galactic Patrol take charge, preparing to escort Yunba back to the Galactic Prison. Krillin then rushes over to Master Roshi, who is punched ferociously from the forest and lies on the ground. Roshi assures Krillin that he's alright, but shares a humorous incident about the convicts he's confronted, mentioning that they won't let him grope them before correcting himself, stating that his attacks won't land. The three female convicts, Misa, Iwaza, and Kikaza arrive, vowing to get revenge. Krillin notices that the convicts possess powerful energy, but suggests Roshi use the same power he displayed against Jiren during the Tournament of Power to defeat them. However, Roshi explains that he can't do it without a clear mind, humorously realizing that his mind is currently clouded with wicked thoughts. Elsewhere, Tien and Chaozu battle Koiter, but Tien's physical attacks prove ineffective due to Koiter's hard Metal Man exterior. Chaozu recalls Vegeta's strategy against Majeta in the Universe 6 tournament and advises Tien to insult Koiter, surprising him. Struggling to come up with an insult, Koiter advances towards Tien. However, Chaozu distracts the Metal Man long enough to come up with an effective insult, leading him to collapse. Back at the other battle, Master Roshi wears a bandana to cover his eyes, allowing him to dodge the convict's attacks skillfully. He urges the girls to abandon their evil ways and return to the galactic prison, but they refuse and instead decide to employ their last resort, fusion into a larger, unattractive form. This form delivers a powerful blow, sending both Krillin and Roshi flying. Meanwhile at the lookout, the group watches the battle and Puar notices Yamcha struggling as well. Suddenly, Eska notices Sagonbo's spaceship as it begins to descend to the ground. Android 18 continues to dominate Shimareka, while Android 17 comes close to defeating 7-3. However, Moro, surprising the group with his presence, arrives to grab 7-3 by the head, chastising him for using his abilities too freely. Moro instructs Shimareka to help him recover back at the spaceship, as he plans to use his power again at some point. The two take off, Saganbo joins Moro, and Piccolo and Gohan acknowledge Moro's immense power. With Goku and Vegeta missing, Gohan affirms their role in protecting Earth until they arrive. Moro, however, states he's in high spirits and explains that Earth is brimming with energy to steal as he considers how to consume everyone. Saganbo volunteers to handle the Z Fighters, dissatisfied with his crew's performance, and Moro agrees as long as he keeps them alive. Before entering the battle, Moro energizes Saganbo significantly with just a hint of his power, and his physique grows before everyone's eyes. At Moro's command, Saganbo rushes in, first attacking Android 17, overpowering him. When the others attempt to support 17, Saganbo 
Rambo easily dominates them, slamming Gohan and Seventeen head first into the ground. Meanwhile, Tien and Chaozu, victorious over Koiter, encounter Yamcha, who's losing his battle against Zoyogi, revealed to be the staff officer of the Galactic Bandit Brigade. Krillin and Roshi hide from the fused female convict, but despite the odds, Krillin decides to go down fighting, hoping that Goku will be able to notice his last burst of power. In space, Goku en route to Earth senses the ongoing battles, but is unable to lock onto anyone's energy as it's depleting by the second. However, Krillin unleashes a burst of energy, alerting Goku of his position on Earth as he uses instant transmission to teleport there. Goku swiftly defeats the overweight convict who is about to attack Krillin and apologizes for not arriving sooner. The fusion of the three convicts dissolves and Goku inquires where everyone else is. Krillin tells Goku they're all fighting around the globe and explains he should check on them to see if they need help. Goku agrees, but before taking off, Krillin inquires if Goku is strong enough to defeat Moro now. Goku says he believes so, and when Krillin questions if he's worried about Moro's power, Goku reveals that he's actually thrilled. He then teleports to Tien, Yamcha, and Shoutsu, who are struggling in their battle against Zayogi. Goku swiftly incapacitates Zayogi with a gut punch, and Yamcha and Tien marvel at Goku's power. As the Galactic Patrol round up more of the defeated convicts, Yamcha informs Goku that Gohan and the others require his assistance. Goku then tosses Zayogi off to Yamcha and teleports away once more.